Welcome to Light Your Way to Health and Wellness with Paula Shaw. I'm delighted to see you here. And for those of you who have been following this show, you know I have been on a bandwagon about something that I have recently learned that I think everyone needs to be educated about. We have been talking in the last couple of episodes about the topic of over-medicating our children. And I shared with you on the first show some of the statistics that were just plain shocking to me about the numbers of children that are being medicated from the age of toddlerhood. Over 10,000 children were medicated toddlers in 2014, and those numbers have been on the rise. So... It's a huge problem. The two areas most commonly medicated are ADHD, attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity, and bipolar disorder, which often happens around the age of 14. Children are put on uh, stimulants and depressants at a time when their brain is still forming. It's absolutely appalling in my opinion. However, I know personally clients and friends of people whose children have gone through episodes of feeling uh, suicidal, of being extremely depressed or extremely manic or aggressive. And it's a real problem and I get it. But I think we need to stretch harder to find ways of dealing with those problems other than just putting them on medication. And the reason I'm feeling so adamant about this is because of a conversation I had last Monday on Memorial Day with a young woman that we're going to call Karen to protect her identity, who has graciously agreed to be my guest on this show And one day in the near future will also be my guest on my radio show, Change It Up Radio, because she wants to tell her story. She wants people to know what she experienced so that she can perhaps spare other kids from going through the same thing. So without any further ado, I want you to meet Karen. So Karen, would you please join us? Now, just to let you all know, she will not be turning on her camera, but in just a moment, she'll have her mic working so we can hear her voice. Hi, Karen. Hi, Paula. I'm so delighted that you are taking the time and the energy to do this interview with me because I know you feel very strongly about this issue of children being medicated, right? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Oh, it's definitely my pleasure. So let's kind of start at the beginning. Um, When were you first medicated? What was the, the circumstance? What was the problem? And how were you affected? Um, I was first medicated at um, 15 by um, a psychiatrist and I was brought to that psychiatrist after um, my parents found out that I had been cutting myself for about a year. Ah. And um, And do you remember why you were cutting yourself? um, I started cutting myself, let's see, when I was 14, so just entered high school because I was very sad. Um, I was extremely lonely and I had just had really difficult time maintaining friendships and um, I struggled with my body image and kind of over dieted and had bulimia and so it just kind of I was introduced to it by a friend and um, that friend said that it helped you know release all of their pain and I was interested in releasing my pain and Mm -hmm. so um, I started doing it. And did you, did it feel like a release for you? I've, I've always wondered what it's like for the kid who is cutting. It did. Um, mm. It felt like I had a scream kind of pent up inside of me for years and um, injuring myself was kind of like a release. 
of that screen. Inter interesting. And mm -hmm. now I think we, we should probably mention, because I feel that all of these things are contributing issues, your parents had gone through a divorce, correct? Yes, they, they divorced when I was in 10 years, almost 10. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they had kind of a turbulent marriage. So um, it was just a hectic time. And, they, and after the divorce, they pulled me out of the school I had been in, which was a teeny little private school and um, enrolled me in a much larger public school. And uh, um, I stuck out like a sore thumb. I just did not fit in. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> and do you remember being unhappy? Were you aware you didn't fit in? Oh, yes. I mean, I remember, I can distinctly remember the first day I walked in and um, I was wearing jeans that were too short and like sneakers that were beat up from climbing trees all summer and no makeup. I wasn't shaving my legs yet, you know. Just, <laughs> and I walked in and there were girls in mini skirts with like spaghetti strapped shirts and oh. makeup. And it was like I was entering a different world. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, here they were looking sort of like um, high school chic, and you look like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, it sounds it's like. <laughs> exactly it. You know, I spent my summer messing around in the backyard, and I think they were playing spin the bottle from the conversations I was hearing, so it's like, ah. quite different. So, and you know, but I think it's common for many girls to feel like they're in the out crowd, you know, because there's only so many that are in the in crowd, right? Oh, yes. I mean, and, you know, girls at that age, that's when the cliques, you know, sixth grade is really when cliques start to form. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's really hard to enter in those tight knit groups of girls and, and they become nasty at that age. So it's like, if you didn't fit in this cookie cutter mold that, you know, everyone wanted you to look what well, you had to look a certain way and act a certain way then you mm -hmm. you know you did what I did which was you know eat lunch by myself and um spend mm -hmm. a lot of time just like wanting to get in the classroom and help the teacher and <laughs> yeah so it was very incredibly lonely incredibly mm. lonely or you take the other path and you act out right you get in exactly. trouble or you start smoking or doing something like that and you know what? And I did all of those things. I finally, I reached a point where I just, I was just trying to get attention and um, not that the cutting was attention seeking, but um, you know, just my other actions, I think was just trying to get someone to notice that I was suffering. Yes. In some way. So, okay, let's go back to where you're now being taken to a psychiatrist at the age of, did you say it was 14 or 15? 15. 15. 15. Mm -hmm. And, and did he do therapy with you? Did, how did he figure out what was wrong with you? And, and, and did he then medicate you? Yes. So he, we had the first appointment was, you know, the 50 minute hour mm -hmm. um, appointment. Um, and within 15 minutes, I received a diagnosis of bipolar two, um, characterized by a severe depression and hypomania. Ooh. Um, yeah, so it was very quick. And I left with a prescription for Lamictal, um, which is a mood stabilizer. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Lexapro, an antidepressant, um, and Seroquel, which is an antipsychotic, um, and the um, medication called Naltrexone, which I believe they use for people addicted to opiates. And oh my goodness. Four yeah. medications he put you on? Yes, within After, 50 minutes. Oh my God. Now you're saying five zero, not one five. Five zero. But after 15 minutes, I had a diagnosis. So Already. So I yes. thought that's what I heard you say. Yes. So you're on four medications mm -hmm. after a 15 minute diagnosis. Now I've been doing a little homework, Karen. And one of the things that I read by a leading expert in this field is that an, an accurate diagnosis takes time and many mm -hmm. exposures, perhaps many sessions, mm -hmm. because so many of the things that teenagers normally do can now fit the expanded criteria in the DSM-4 or 5, wherever they are now. Yes. 
I mean, that's, that seems completely accurate. Um, teenagers just, are no fun. <laughs> it's not fun to be a teenager. Your brain is going haywire. <laughs> well, exactly. And, you know, Dr. Lawrence Kel Kelmanson, who was one of the people that wrote an article that I read, he put it so well. He said, adolescence is such a stressful time because of the social relationship pressure, which you've just described. Mm -hmm. um, Set the rebellion, the normal natural rebellion and separation from parents. Oh yeah, changing bodies and hormones that you're dealing with, and and worries about the future. That's just a few things that are major normal changes that kids are going through, and so they're all over the place. Yeah. Plus, you you are in that that stage of life where you're not a child anymore, but you're also not an adult. And yeah. you're struggling to figure it out. Your peers mean everything to you. Fitting in means everything. Mm -hmm. And if all those pieces aren't in place, you're in turmoil, right? Exactly, yeah. And you know, and I mean, yes, you wanna be accepted. And I, de I know I desperately wanted to be accepted. and. And that's really even when the eating disorder started, just because I was looking at these girls and I was tall and athletic and they were tiny and, you know, a little bit malnourished. And, um, <laughs> and I wanted to, but they had friends and they had boyfriends. And mm -hmm. so I said, you know, I got to look like that if I want to fit in. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's what I did. I, you know, ended up being extremely bulimic and restricting foods and for a, until I was about 29, I think. Oh, so, my. Oh, yeah. my. And time. so now let's back up for a minute. You leave the doctor's office with a prescription for four drugs. Mm -hmm. Did they help? Did they work? How did you feel? Um, I was extremely sick. Um, one of the side effects of naltrexone um, was uh, extreme nausea and vomiting. And, oh. um, and I just, I never, I didn't feel good. Um, and I've just felt sad still. And I kind of felt broken in a mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there was sort of this like duality of the experience because I was look, you know, at four, 15, you're looking for an identity. I mean, that's right. even part of Eric Erickson and he has eight stages of, I think, lifespan development. And it's, you know, at that age, you're looking for identity. And this psychiatrist basically told me, he said, you are bipolar mm -hmm. instead of you have it, you are. Uh. And, and I internalized that. And that became, I looked at myself as completely broken and needing medications to fix me. And, mm -hmm. um, and that colored how I viewed myself until last, just last year, I'd say. So for the next 15 years, I just saw myself as this broken individual who needed someone to put her back together. And, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things Dr. Kelmanson mentions is that once you're labeled, then it, it, it shifts both the parent's perception of you and your mm -hmm. perception of yourself. So on the one hand, yes, you had this ID now, uh, somebody had told you who you were, but then, you know, instead of working things out on your bad days, which is what normally would happen with a teenager, parents start blaming the bad days on the meds not working, or maybe mm -hmm. they forgot their meds or something. Mm -hmm. And you start realizing as a kid, A, the, the kinds of things you describe, that you're broken, mm -hmm. that um, you've got this diagnosis, which does a lot of things. Sometimes you don't have to work as hard at curbing your behavior or learning appropriate ways of being respectful or managing your aggression. Um, because you've got an excuse. You're the sick kid. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, sometimes parents aren't putting the time into sitting down and trying to work through and talk things out with kids who are medicated because they think there's this brain disease there 
and they're not looking at it the same way a parent would look at their normal crazy teenager. Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, yes, I've, yeah, that, that totally rings true to my experience. I can't tell you the number of times I acted out and, you know, someone didn't say like, did you forget to take your meds this morning? And, mm -hmm. and that, I mean, the diagnoses and the meds and that attitude towards that my parents and my family had towards me, you know, one, it just reinforced the broken identity and the mentally right. ill identity, but it also alleviated the responsibility that I had for my atrocious behavior. Yes, exactly. I felt little remorse for any of the things I did that were wrong um, mm -hmm. because I just chalked it up to being mentally ill and then I moved on. I said, this is just how you are. <laughs> and as, as you've described to me before, your ability to feel was numbed. Oh my gosh, yes. And I didn't know that. Um, I was always told I was a nice person, but I'm real, I realized just within this past year that I wasn't acting with empathy because I have empathy now, but I certainly didn't have that for about mm -hmm. 15 years. And so wow. um, it's, it's, been, it's been wild <laughs> to realize that. <laughs> yeah. And here's something that also was shocking for me to learn uh, because so many children are given stimulants to address their ADHD. Yeah. After long-term use of stimulants and during adolescence, the stimulant calms the child who has ADHD, but as you grow older, it acts to make you more aggressive. Oh God, yeah. And, and they were saying it can even uh, exacerbate the symptoms or the behaviors that make you uh, seem appropriate for the diagnosis of bipolar. Oh yeah, I mean, they actually prescribed me, um, I can't remember, I think it, maybe it was Adderall for a short period of time mm -hmm. um, because I couldn't pay attention because I was so overly medicated. Ugh. So, um, but they said, you know, well, you, you know, a you might have ADD as well. Um, we don't know. It's, it could run in your family. It could be whatever, but, um, right. But it wasn't unusual for people to be on for in the group therapies I was in. I mean, the cocktail I was on, the psychotic, the antipsychotic, the antidepressant, mood stabilizer, benzodiazepine, um, and the ADD meds were so common. I mean, that was just a common cocktail. And, and about how many meds is that? That's like four or five? Um, I was usually on between five and six at a time. Oh um, my goodness. So when I, this past year, when I got off of everything, um, I think I de-prescribed from about some six medicines. Oh my goodness. And they were all at high doses, the dosages, so. And over the years, you saw several different psychiatrists. Yeah. Did any of them ever like try to do therapy with you or take the time to really see what was going on with you? Um, I had, let's see, for the majority of the time, um, I, let's see, I had, a, I bounced between a couple different psychiatrists um, from the time I was 15 to 30. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and it, what would happen was, I would be okay for about a year and then I'd have a suicide attempt. And then my parents would say, well, this psychiatrist isn't working. Let's try a new one. Mm. And, um, and so, no, um, the one I had the majority of the time who actually fired me as a patient and then, um, cause I was abusing some of, you know, abusing drugs and, um, in an act to try to feel something. Um, uh, he, you, mean, he, you were abusing recreational drugs? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, and uh, that was frustrating to him. Um, but uh, so this one, the one he, I had him for a majority of the time and our appointments were about 15 to 30 minutes. And basically I'd come in, unload all my symptoms on him and he'd say, well, let's see, you're already at the maximum dose of this. So let's try you on this one in addition, we'll leave you on this one because it's not killing you. It's not giving you a deadly rash or, you know, <sighs> whatever. Um, but which was a, a side effect of Lamictal. Um, but uh, mm. so I didn't, but the one I had at the end, um, he, 
he was the only one that met with me for an hour every time and he incorporated um, cognitive behavioral therapy into the session. Ah. And he is the one that suggested, um, you know, that he kind of recognized, he said, you are way over medicated. Um, he's just kept saying that to me. So. Thank God. Thank, Thank God. God. Right? Somebody brought that to your attention. Mm -hmm. But you, you mentioned along the way in this last conversation here, Karen, that um, you had suicide attempts. I thought the whole idea of medicating you was to get you to a better state so that suicide was not looking like an option. Gosh, you, you would think so. Um, <laughs> uh, that was certainly the hopes that we had when I started the medications. Um, and, uh, but I had my first one at 17. So it was two years after I started the meds and it was a serious one. And I am very lucky at, to have survived it. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the hospital for a while and um, was very ill. And, um, and then I had one at 19, 21. Oh. Um, and, uh, and then and I guess maybe those were the few that were ended that I ended up in the hospital. The others were minor, and I think they were just kind of an act of desperation. So, so, so you're attempting suicide. You're mm -hmm. being hospitalized, mm -hmm. and it's not occurring to any of these doctors that something's not working. No, um, they said it was my illness progressing, and that I was treatment oh. resistant, um, and. I was hallucinating also. I, um, the, so when I started the meds about six months or maybe, maybe three months after actually starting them, um, I began having vivid hallucinations, um, wow. auditory and visual. And so they just saw that as an onset of a, you know, a massive mental illness and, um, and they told me I would never, I would always be dependent on medications and therapy and, you know, never have any life outside of that world. So. Oh my God. And at one point, I think you told me too, you even had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, right? They were toying oh, was with it me. multiple personality or both? I had both. Um, so I had a schizo, it was mostly schizoaffective disorder, which is kind of like, um, a combination of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So you have the ups and downs of mm. bipolar, and then you have the hallucinations from schizophrenia. Um, and, and I did receive the multiple, uh, it's called, I think now they refer to it as a dissociative identity disorder, mm -hmm. um, which is basically multiple personalities. And um, I received that following um, my 12, electroconvulsive therapy treatments at 21. Oh my God. You had electroshock therapy at 21? Yes. 12 treatments. Yes. And, and how was your brain after that? Um, it was awful. Um, I would forget what I was saying. Um, I would forget to put shoes on, um, to like go outside. I, would space out and have time, a massive amount of time that was unaccounted for, which, mm. which led to the diagnosis. They, you know, I was functioning during that time, but I just couldn't remember what happened. And, um, and they said, uh, you know, because I was dissociating, they thought I, you know, was exhibiting multiple personalities. And so I began like a rigorous treatment for that, which mm. was, um, which was just not the case. I was, my brain was just fried. Yes. <laughs> Quite literally. <laughs> and, and that particular treatment is very controversial. Some people are very against it. And then there are others who think it has value, but uh, everyone I've ever known or heard of who had it had terrible memory loss afterwards. Yes. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm mind boggled that these professionals who put you through a certain treatment, then almost punish you when you have the normal natural outcome of yeah. the memory loss. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it was like you couldn't win. No. And I, 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 will, I, I can only assume, because I know your parents love you, mm -hmm. that they were buying into what the medical people were telling them. Is that correct? So, yes and no. Um, my... 
one of my parents um, was against the medications from the get-go. Um, I see. And he, they, they just never believed. I always got straight A's. I was a good athlete. Um, mm -hmm. They just looked at me and they just said, there's no way that there's no way that I, you're sick, you know, and my therapist would say, well, that's just this person, you know, denying this, your identity and who you are. And, and they kind of made him, you know, a lot of them made him out or them out to be a villain almost in my mm -hmm. eyes. And, um, mm -hmm. and the other parent is a doctor and, um, in the beginning, they didn't see a problem with the meds, but then as things didn't improve, um, instead of offering a solution, they just said, just don't tell your doctors about your symptoms anymore. Don't tell them that your hallucinations are getting worse because you'll just be on more meds. And oh my I just God. said, you know, I said, well, what the heck? Like, I can't live with these, you know, I believed my doctors were trying to help and I didn't want to hallucinate. I was, I spent most, I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified of the hallucinations. They were horrible. So. Oh, I can't imagine. So what was the turning point, Karen? Because it sounds like your life was a nightmare. It was, um, it was absolutely a nightmare. Um, it just never got better. And I actually had two grand mal seizures um, that were attributed to the high dosage of Welbutrin that I was on. Um, and um, so at 29, I made the decision to end my life um, and began kind of about six months, I just started writing letters to my family um, and really planning it out. Um, I had a dog, I was trying to figure out, you know, who would take care of her and, mm. um, and it was a very detailed plan and, um, and I was letting go and I got rid of friends, um, some really dear friends. I completely got rid of them because I didn't want to have to deal with that in the end. Mm -hmm. And, um, on my third, and I committed to on my 30th birthday to taking my life because I was done. I had had it. <laughs> and I had gained yeah. about 96 pounds or about almost a hundred pounds. Oh my. And, and I just, and I couldn't lose it and I wasn't eating wrong or poorly. It just couldn't shake it. So I was mm -hmm. done. I was mm -hmm. thrown in the towel at 30. Oh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah. it's so heartbreaking and gut wrenching to hear that. And yet I get it. I mean, what, where was your joy? Where was the good times? What part of your life made you sing and feel happy? Doesn't feel like there was much there. It never did. It was just, you know, some days the degrees of suffering were less than others, but it was just suffering day in and day out. Yeah. Um, and it's not a life. It's, I was not alive. Yeah. Um, and so I was very lucky I'm um, on my 30th birth I kind of had vocalized what I was going to do to my doctors um and I just said I'm out guys like I'm done um and uh you know so on my 30th birthday um I, I had two friends and they took me to Disneyland for the weekend mm -hmm. of all places and I remember thinking I was mad at first. I was like, oh, you know, like, I do not want to put this off. Like I have something to do this weekend and <laughs> I've been planning it. And, and my doctor said, you know, you either go to Disneyland this weekend, or we are putting you in the hospital that I like, uh, it's called Mesa Vista. So they're putting me in Mesa Vista for my 30th birthday. And I was like, mm. well, I do not want to go back there. So um, mm -hmm. I said, I'll, fine, I'll, I will go to Disneyland. <laughs> and <laughs> A good uh, decision, dear. <laughs> a good decision, right? Disneyland's always fun. And um, yeah. so I went and I just had this, I, I remember I was sitting outside the gates and my two friends were, I don't know where they actually were, but um, I watched this beautiful interaction between a mother and daughter. And um I just, I think like that I've seen, and obviously I'd seen interactions like that before, but I think that that combined with like the finality of my decision that was going to of taking my life in a few days, just kind of made me pause and say like, 
like that's so final. And, um, and I think a huge part of me recognized that I didn't actually want to die. I just wanted all of the pain and the, I wanted everything to stop just for a minute, just so I could, you know, have some peace. And I also wanted that happiness that I was seeing. I was just, I wanted that, in, you know, to feel what they were feeling. They were mm-hmm. so happy. Hmm. And so I just, just like, you know, uh, you got, you can kill yourself any day. Um, well, you know, like it's true. <laughs> mm-hmm. You absolutely can. And, um, and I just said, what would it look like to get what they had and, um, to get that, you know, the special relationship between a mother and daughter. And at the time my brain went to, well, you know, you are covered in cuts and burns and you're, you know, extremely overweight. Like no one's going to want to have children with you. So I said, um, I'm going to do IVF. I think that's, I went home let that after that weekend, researched it. And I think the next week I went to my therapist and just told her the plan. I said, I looked into it. I'm a good candidate. I'm going to do it. So, um, and IVF is in vitro fertilization. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was your goal. That's what saved you from ending your life that you you want to do, try to do IVF and have a child. Yes, it was. I mean, in the, when I look back on that decision, it really truly wasn't the IVF that saved my life. It was just that small part of me that knew something could be better. Mm -hmm. Um, I, that I wanted something for the first Mm -hmm. time. And, um, I think that part of me always existed, but it was so muted and numbed by the medication and the treatment that I had been receiving. Mm -hmm. And, but it existed. And, um, and I'm so lucky that it came through on that one Saturday afternoon. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yes. So, (laughs) so lucky. And so were all of us. Who, who knew you and loved you. And so your doctor told you, if you want to do IVF, you got to be off these drugs, right? Yes. Um, and how did so, that happen? So that was a big conversation and they were all supportive of it, um, of me doing going through with the procedure because they said it was the first time they felt like I was clinging to life. Um, mm-hmm. And he said... Um, he said, so we've got to look at what it's going to look like to take you off these meds. And um, there's no, there is that. There, so there's, you have to taper off of them slowly, which mm-hmm. looks different for everyone. Um, and there's no set schedule. And I was on such high dosages that um, like they were incredibly high. And um, so we, we didn't do it slow. Um, we thought we were going slow, but I've, after doing a lot of reading, it can take years to get off the, you know, oh. the amount that I was on. And I wow. did six meds in six months. Whoa. So. And what was that like for you? I mean, physically, what were you experiencing? Um, physically, it was exhausting. Um, uh, it was, but it was, it was interesting. Um, it was just, it was both emotionally and physically draining because, um, I was so worried that I would, my, my, they kept warning me that, um, the hallucinations might increase and my mood might go completely out of whack and be uncontrollable. And, um, and I had, the meds were giving me rage at some point. Mm -hmm. And so they were worried that that was going to be out of control. And so I was terrified. Um, Absolutely. That was a huge unknown you were facing. Yes. Um, and uh, so when I, but it was, what happened was incredible. Um, so I got off Seroquel, the antipsychotic first. And, and Seroquel was to help you not have hallucinations, right? That's correct. I was prescribed it in the be- very beginning. I was given it. They give it at low dosages to people who have um, bipolar disorder to actually manage um, the mood swings. Mm. And then they at high dosages, though, they give it to you to control hallucinations. And um, they kept raising it um, every couple weeks when I was 15 
and um, and it went up quickly. And so after a few months of being on that, I had started hallucinating, and then they really raised it. Uh. Um, so I was on an incredible amount. Um, I honestly don't know how I was awake for, <laughs> for like just during the day because I took yeah. it in the morning and at night. Oh. Um, so, but after I finished coming off of it, I stopped hallucinating. And when you stopped the drug that was supposed yeah. to stop your hallucinations, then mm -hmm. the hallucination stopped? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Oh um, my God. Oh and my God. it was, I mean, it was a relief, but it was, we were confused and <laughs> no one had told me that that was a side effect of, of Seroquel. And I, I didn't know, um, I knew weight gain was, but I didn't know that the hallucinations were. And um, so that was promising. So we kept going and, you know, we took away lithium, I believe next. And then, and I was on a mega dose of lithium. Mm. And, um, Which is to level you out from the, the mania, right? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. And, um, you know, my mood improved. Um, we took away, I believe I was on, oh man, I'm going to mess this up. I was an SSRI. Um, uh, it was a antidepressant. Right. Um, I can't remember which one it is at the moment, but I believe it was Zoloft. I want to say it's Zoloft was pretty popular. So was Prozac. So. Yes, and I was on all of those. Uh, um, at one point, I've mm -hmm. been probably on almost thirty different meds in oh, over the course of time. God. But um, I came off the antidepressant and was happy. Um, my mood <laughs> oh my completely lifted. Um, oh my God. And I came off of, um, Dizipramine, which is kind of an older antidepressant, I believe, um, uh -huh. mood lifted. Um, I was on propranolol to control my dissociative identity disorder. Um, huge doses mm. of that. And, um, and also helps with anxiety and, um, and I was fine. And, but the one that was trickiest and that put me through the ringer was, um, I was on a uh, clonazepam and I was on big doses of it. Um, and I was on it. And twice that's a, a benzodiazepine, right? Yes. It was a benzodiazepine yeah. and it's incredibly addictive and habit forming. And I had been on it Terrible. as prescribed, um, since I was, uh, 17, I believe, or some form oh, of a benzodiazepine yeah. for since I was 17 and, um, went fine. It went fine for the first, for most of like the tapering. But then that last, after I took the last dose, my body just, and my brain just went haywire and I couldn't keep food down. I couldn't sleep for two weeks, like not a wink. Um, mm -hmm. I was just paralyzed by anxiety attacks and um, just shaking and um, I oh, couldn't, God. I was not making sense. Um, I had a, a very irrational fears um, and I was just paralyzed um, by them. And um, it was quite the experience. <laughs> oh my God. Sounds like a, a triple nightmare on top yeah. of all the rest. Yes, it was crazy. And how did you crazy. get through that? Um, well, with my, you know, I, my family had a lot, had to have a lot of patience with me. Oh, um, I'll bet. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone, you know, my doctors and um, they just kept suggesting, my family just kept, kind. well, some of my family kept suggesting, you know, why don't you go back on a little bit of clonazepam, like for all of our sakes. And, <laughs> and I just said, you know, no, like I'm reading all of this literature and this, you are not supposed to be on these meds for more than a short period of time. And exactly. They're poison. They are poison. Mm -hmm. And they're also it's not a real fix. If you mm -hmm. are anxious about something that's actually going on in your life, a medication is not going to make whatever that situation is better. It's yes. going to mask how you feel about it. And then, you know, but your brain and your emotions have got to manifest in some way. Mm -hmm. So they'll find their way out and it mm -hmm. will not be pretty. It was not pretty for me. So mm -hmm. Um, and that's such a great point you make. You know, if, if you're struggling with body image mm -hmm. or you're struggling because you don't like your hair or whatever, 
the med is not changing that piece. All it's doing is taking the intensity off the feeling. Absolutely. And loneliness too, which was mm -hmm. my um, biggest struggle. Um, it didn't give me friends. The meds did not give me friends yeah. and it didn't make me a friend to myself. That's for sure. So. Oh, God, that's so well put, Karen. So well put. <laughs> so how did you get through getting off the benzos? Well, um, so I told my psychiatrist, I said, no way am I going on clonazepam again. I just got off of it. Mm -hmm. um, what else you got? You know, <laughs> and, um, and he said, he's like, why don't you try a little bit of marijuana? And I was, you know, blown away by that because mm -hmm. since I was 19, people had been convincing me I was a drug addict and I actually went to rehab for it. And, oh, wow. said, you know, like you are a drug addict, you cannot do drugs anymore. And I said, oh, okay, I, I'm a drug addict. I will not do drugs anymore. So I didn't drink or use drugs um, since I was 19 years old um, because someone said I was. And so I just stopped. And I now mm -hmm. I look back on it and I'm just, I think to myself, like that is not what a drug addict does. Like there was no relapse. There was no second guessing. There was just like, okay, you, this is what you say. Like yeah. I'm done. So and um, I find it kind of ironic that they're calling you a drug addict as they are prescribing drugs for you. Oh, I mean, they were, the psychiatrists were my drug dealers. Like they, mm -hmm. I bought more drugs from them than anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> so good point. Um, yeah, and so, so did the CBD help? It did. I had a CBD THC um, mixture and like a, a vape pen mm -hmm. <laughs> and I used it. I was so scared to use it, by the way, um, because I firmly believed I was going to abuse it. Um, and right. my doctors just kept saying, um, you know, if anyone needs to smoke a little pot, like it's definitely you. Yeah. <laughs> we really are giving you the actual green light to go do this. Yeah. Um, so um, anyway, I used it for about two weeks at mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I didn't, the, after the first night, I didn't have panic attacks. I slept, wow. I regained my appetite. And after just the first night, after the first night, I finally wow. got a little piece of time. God. Oh my God. That's so beautiful. Yeah. So um, Karen, before we run out of time, mm -hmm. tell us what does life feel like now? You're completely off all your meds. And have been for how long? It's been exactly a year this month. Oh, oh my God, that's so perfect. So perfect. <laughs> so I know what I saw the other day and it brought tears to me <laughs> because it truly was like you had returned from the dead. <laughs> and But tell me, describe for uh, our viewers and listeners, what, what do you feel now? What is life like for you now? It's just been in the most gratifying, incredible experience I've ever had in my entire life. Um, I have confidence, which I never had. Mm -hmm. um, I have gratitude, which I can honestly say I didn't have um, ever, really. I mean, I was thankful for things, but not like this. Yeah. Um, and I feel everything. And sometimes it's overwhelming. And I know I run high and low sometimes, but... Um, I think everyone does. And it's just, I, I can't even, I mean, it brings tears to my eyes just to think about how it feels to finally feel emotions. I had emotions before I had sadness, mm -hmm. I had happiness, but I never felt it before ever in my body. And just like with my heart and, and mm -hmm. it's just been, it's just been, oh my God, it's just been incredible. <laughs> Oh, that is so beautiful to hear. It sounds to me like you're alive. I'm alive. And it, <laughs> I've honestly, I never thought I would even be ha ever happy. I'd never thought I'd be happy to say that ever. Oh. And what about the suicidal ideation? It completely went away. Mm -hmm. um, I think after I got rid of the, you know, after I stopped withdrawing from the benzodiazepine, I, I just, I just wanted to live and I was 
craving stimulation because I realized I hadn't had any in like mm-hmm. for my most of my life. And mm-hmm. um, so um, it completely went away and I had goals all of a sudden. I wanted to, you know, pursue like more educate to get more ed- education and mm-hmm. get a higher degree and take on more responsibility at work and have my friends again, which I had driven away. Uh-huh. Um, and it's just been incredible. I didn't want to hurt. I was hurting myself for, you know, including the years I was bulimic. It's been 17 years of just putting myself through torture mm-hmm. and, um, and it just went away, just went away. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, may I say that I'm on the top of the list of people that are <laughs> so glad (laughs) so glad that you had the courage to stay and to do what you did because i know that was not easy and that you had the courage to keep living when the nightmare was in full blast full bloom (laughs) and i'm just so thrilled and delighted to hear these things that you just said and i saw it for myself the other day And I can't thank you enough for coming on this show with me because we we need to let parents know what it's like from the kids' side because I'll bet you never were able to articulate as clearly as you can now what you were experiencing. And all these well-meaning people thought they were helping you and they were killing you. That's completely right um Mm -hmm. i think that the more i look back on it i just see like we are turning adolescence and all of the hormonal changes into a disease and it's not okay to not be okay anymore and i just think it is so important i mean it is not okay to feel it is okay to feel suicidal it's not okay you know it's it's definitely a, a feeling it's, but it's not a disease, and I think it's really common, especially nowadays, for kids, you know, actually, it's probably been going on forever, but mm-hmm. um, those feelings, and um, it's just these meds do not have a place in the adolescent brain. Most adolescent brains can't say it 100%, but yeah, um, you got to give kids a fighting chance. I didn't, was not given a fighting chance, and um And I didn't, wasn't because I was medicated, I never developed the coping mechanisms I needed to navigate through tricky situations like an adolescence and Mm -hmm. college. And, um, and I've had to figure all of that out as a 30 year old, 31 year old now. And, Mm -hmm. um, and it's been, I'm grateful I've had even had the opportunity to do that, but it was, it's a tough road to put a kid down Mm -hmm. and, and I am, no, I am lucky that I had the wherewithal to get out of it. And that was even a fluke how I got out of it, really. It was not because I didn't think I had a problem. It was because I was pursuing IVF, which I uh-huh. didn't follow through with, by the way. Um, but well, now you're so beautiful and wonderful and happy <laughs> and vibrant. You will find that man who will be dying to marry you and have children with you. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just... Um, it's adolescence is not a disease and sadness and loneliness are not diseases and you can't medicate loneliness. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't help. And I think what, what really children need adolescents need is they need to be talked with. Mm -hmm. They need to be heard. They need boundaries. They need consequences. Mm -hmm. They need to be treated like people who are going through a tough a tough time of life filled with transitions Mm -hmm. so yeah you're up and you're down and you're all over the place but if they know they're loved Mm -hmm. if they know that you parents will sit down with them and work things through and that you have expectations of respectful good behavior and there are boundaries and there are limits Mm -hmm. then you take the disease out of adolescence and you help them mature into yes. beautiful young people, young oh, adults. And, and just I am, to even add to that, I completely agree with you, but 
and I know that my healing didn't come about until I had felt I had value and that I was safe and oh, beautiful. Um, and yeah, I just think that it's so important. Everyone just wants to be of value and feel like they have someone or something to depend on, even if it's themselves and the meds and that whole experience and identifying overly identifying being mentally ill robbed. Com I was completely robbed of that being able to, you know, learn to trust myself and to trust others and to learn that I couldn't contribute to something. I can do things. And um, so, yeah, I think those are all important things to, if your kid is struggling, maybe instead of handing them a med, you need to look at the situation and figure out how you're going to build them up instead of just numb them out. Oh my God, that is a perfect line to end this show on. Figure out how you're going to build them up instead of how you're going to numb them out. <laughs> Karen, I am so grateful on so many levels. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the enlightenment you've brought to the listeners of this show. And bless you, you have a very bright future ahead, and I intend to be there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for letting me share on this topic. This is very important. It is very important. And I think you and I have more work to do together. We're going to get the word out there in every way that we can. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Deal. All right. And thank you all for being with us. And on that note, we will say goodbye. <laughs>